Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. After last week's difficult conversation, I thought that it would be a good opportunity for us to have an episode that's much more lighthearted. That's why today's guest is Ray Blakeney, an award-winning Filipino-American entrepreneur who has over a decade of experience bootstrapping and operating six- and seven-figure location-independent businesses. He and his businesses have been featured in magazines such as Entrepreneur, Forbes, the Boston Globe, and other top publications. He's currently running Live Linga, an online language learning platform, and Podcast Hawk, a SaaS platform that helps businesses and influencers find and pitch podcasts on autopilot. In this wide-ranging conversation that is very lightly edited and a very strong departure from my normal episodes. We discuss language learning, travel, bootstrapping companies, manufacturing, and kendo. I love this episode because him and I have a very similar mentality and philosophy about life and travel and running businesses, and it was really good to be able to capture that and share it with you in this way, because sometimes with different guests, I'll have questions prepared. Other times I don't have questions prepared. And I feel like the more interviews I do, the more people I speak with, the more I learn about them and their lifestyles and their mindsets, the more I learn how to become a better interviewer. And what I've discovered is the best interviews are the ones that aren't planned. Now, I'm sure I could have sat him down to discuss the specifics of building his 150 plus person team, which is what I normally do. But in this episode, I wanted to do something that I kind of wanted the original concept of the podcast to be, which is like, you get to listen to two entrepreneurs having a chat. And if you weren't listening to this podcast, you'd probably never hear a conversation like this. And that's why it's important to share this kind of an episode with you. Now, you may like it, you may not. The first few minutes, 10 minutes possibly, are just about language learning, so you might get bored there, but stick with it because it leads into a much more interesting conversation, and that's why I kept that content in. Later in the episode, there's uh, content that gets quite silly talking about chocolate because he owned a chocolate factory, but again, stick with it because it leads into you know another part of the discussion about manufacturing and dropshipping and things that are really important that you might find interesting. So I hope you really like this episode. It's episode 89. We're getting so close to episode 100. I can't wait. I don't know what I'm going to do for it yet, but I'm excited nonetheless. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Ray. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you do right now and how you got to this point? The short of it is I work at home in my Superman pajamas and I have been doing so for 15 years. The long answer to it is I bootstrap seven-figure online businesses. Um, We own a website called LiveLingua.com, which is the third largest online language school in the world. My wife and I bootstrap that. I run a software company called podcasthawk.com. We have some pretty well-known people in the podcast space who are involved, like Pat Fling, who is an advisor and a shareholder in that company. For those of you who listen to a lot of entrepreneur podcasts. And I've owned a chocolate factory in Asia for a while. I had a marketing agency for a few years. I'm a software developer by training. I quit my job, my six-figure almost software engineer job to work for the Peace Corps for $150 a month. So I've done quite a few little things. But yeah, generally I'm at home in my Superman pajamas. So I remember during our first call, you had talked about Peace Corps and I had said, I thought about doing it like 15 years ago, but I was kind of like, uh, I'd like to earn more than a few thousand dollars in a year. So it'd be nice to nice to do something different. Right. I remember it was like 5,000 for a year or something. I was like, I know I'm going to be living in the middle of nowhere, so I probably won't spend anything, but like... Mm-hmm. 
to commit for two years to do that is hard. It is. So yeah, you're absolutely right. So you don't, nobody does a Peace Corps for the money. Not even close. At the end, they do give you what's called a readjustment allowance, which in my time, this was like 15 years ago, was about after taxes, about $2,000. The whole idea was that, but that was basically for you to buy your plane ticket back to the US and put your first month deposit on an apartment, right? I mean, it wasn't like money. There are tons of reasons to do the Peace Corps. Money is definitely not one of them. One of the reasons is if you ever want to learn another language, um, something, you know, near to my heart because I run a language school. Actually, I've also ran a chain of language schools in Mexico, which we sold in 2012. Peace Corps will do it for you. You will be fluent in whatever language in the country you, you get sent to. It's hands down guaranteed. You're living there with the people who do not speak a lick of English most of the time. And unless you learn Spanish, Swahili, you know, Iqbatan, if you're somewhere in the Pacific Islands or whatever, you're not going to be able to communicate and order, you know, something at the local store. So you learn your language. Within six months, you'll be conversational. Within two years, you will be fluent. If you go to a part of the world where, you know, the language is not as commonly spoken, you might be like the only person in your state when you go back to the U.S. who like one of five people who actually speaks that language, which is kind of cool. Or you can all go to a place where it's more widely spoken. This is how I learned Spanish, you know, French, whatever language. You'll be fluent at those languages in two years. So you look at it that way. I found that staying in China was more profitable. I was positioned where I understood them and I could help them understand the West. Exactly. And they couldn't do that without me. And that's where my niche was. And that's how I launched my career. So wherever you go, you can find a business opportunity there. Even if it's a country most people don't go to, you might be the first person to import or export from that country. You know, wow, what kind of things could that open up? Or outsourcing in that country that nobody's done outsourcing in that country before. You could be the person to open that door. Not only is it good for you, but it's also good for the people in that country who might be helping, helping them build a life that they otherwise could not have done without your help. Well, so right now I'm applying to move to Portugal. We had also talked about that on the phone. And through the process, I'm, I'm documenting every tiny detail that I'm going through because I, I may know people in the future who want to go through it too. Not, look at, not like I'm looking to make money off of the knowledge of that process, but to make it easier for the people I care about to make it easier for them. But through the process, I'm seeing extreme inefficiencies in many different pieces of it and going, wow, if I didn't have a business I really loved right now, I could probably make multiple businesses out of these other little pieces that people are screwing up magnificently. I like to say that there are two kinds of entrepreneurs in the world. They're the visionary entrepreneurs, those who kind of invent stuff that we didn't even know we needed. Right. We're talking like, you know, Steve Jobs invented the iPhone. It's not like everybody was out there like, I need an iPhone and he built an iPhone. He just created something out of scratch. People want to go to the moon. Tesla, you know, Elon Musk building Tesla. These are visionary entrepreneurs. I'm not one of those kind of entrepreneurs. The second kind of entrepreneur I, is the kind I am, which is we see that there are problems. Nobody's fixing the problem or not, not fixing it well. And we build a business around that. So if you're that kind of person, then traveling is amazing, right? Because if you're stuck, so I lived in Ohio for a while. So if you're stuck in Cleveland, Ohio, and you never leave, you might never get exposed to some of these problems, like what you're having, Sean, when you're moving to Portugal. You never would have known until you tried to move to Portugal that this was a business opportunity. So, you know, these are the kind of things that when you travel and go to other places, it might be something that you see that missing because you're trying to move there. Or you might go to another country and see that they do something better there that they don't do back at home really well. So you can go back home and suddenly you're like, hey, guys, have you ever thought of doing this here? Let's build a business around that. And it's, you know, it could take off. And a lot of this, you know, food is an easy example. Poke bowls, which they seem to be on every corner now. Like 10 years ago, I had never heard of these things before, right? But somebody went to Hawaii, saw it, hey, this is cool, brought it back. And now it's like this ph phenomenon, crepes or another thing. There are all these different things out there. Um, that people have gotten from traveling that they bring back to the United States and it works or you bring something from the US to Latin America and then it takes off right or to Europe or to Asia and build the, the equivalent over there. That is also business opportunity. For sure. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the details of your businesses. You said that you've run multiple seven figure businesses. What would you say is the one that you're the most proud of and why? I would say probably Live Lingua right now is the one that I'm most proud of. So Live Lingua is one of the top online language schools in the world. There are some competitors that have gotten up to $60 million in BC capital. Live Lingua was started with me and my wife. So I made the first website as my background. So I'm a computer engineer. I like to clarify here, I'm not a graphic designer, so I made the website, but it looked awful. I mean, I can do the code, but I mean, it was really, really ugly. It was like five pages. This is back in 2008. So there was like WordPress barely existed. You know, I just made this really awful um, five page website. And it was primarily to help find, you know, tutors for, you know, students for my, for my wife, who was a Spanish teacher. And yeah, I learned something called SEO, search engine optimization, back in 2008 as well. Not that many people were doing it. It was kind of this gray area. So I like, yeah, let me 
we do some SEO, see what happens. At the time, we were running a brick and mortar language school as well. To our surprise, within three months, we three to six months, we were actually making more off of our online tutoring. My wife, obviously, within like a week, she had like a hundred percent close rate. So you know, within a week, she had more students than she knew how to handle. We had to start ha hiring other students, and that's how we built this business up. And yeah, competitors have come since then with a lot of money. But one of the beautiful things about it, since we are the only mom and pop, quote unquote, operation here, we get to personalize it a little bit more. We're a little more boutique. So our prices are a little higher than the competitors, but the competitors need 10,000 students. I mean, you know, they have to pay back the guy who gave them $60 million in BC. So do you really think that person is out for the best interest of the students? Probably not, right? They're trying to make as much money as possible, as fast as possible, so that some BC person and them can make a big exit and then they all live rich. For us, this is, we did it year by year. We had, I joke that if I ever wrote a book, it'd be called Seven, seven Years to Seven Figures and nobody would buy it. That's what it took us. I mean, you know, we built it bit by bit. Every year, first year was like $40,000 and we went up to $60,000, like about 20% every year. But you do that for 14, 15 years consistently and you have a very successful business at the end of it. Um, so we've been successful. I'm proud of Live Lingua because we've been successful because we've just, you know, we wake up every morning, we take one step forward, trying to make a better quality product, you know, give better classes to our students, treat our teachers better. And that's it. That's all we do. And we do one step forward, one step forward. We don't have to grow 100% every year because we have nobody to pay back. Um, I live in Mexico, so my cost of living is a fraction of the United States. And we just keep doing that. So the business is registered in the US, so I still pay taxes there, all that kind of stuff. It's an American business. But the people who come and study with us are not paying for me to live in an expensive house in the United States. So how many employees do you have? How many teachers do you have? Do you have like a leadership team or are you still running the day-to-day -day on this? Depends on how you count on employees. So technically speaking, it's an LLC, uh, you know, with an escort. So it means I am technically the only employee. That being said, we have 150 people working with us. It's a technicality for the IRS, right? Almost all of my employees are foreigners. So they're contractors, even though they're full-time. We have a leadership team. I have a COO who takes care of most of the day-to-day -day operations. I'm more kind of, this happened in the last year, and a, year, year and a half. I'm pulling back kind of more into the visionary role, kind of coming up with ideas, kind of motivating the team. So I kind of give the speeches at the team meetings. Or we have four divisions, CTO, academic director, marketing, and COO kind of thing, which is kind of general operations. Those, that's my leadership team. So they're the ones who report directly to me. Of that 150, most, are most of them are tutors and teachers that work for us, right? So we run a really lean ship. We have no office anywhere pay no rent, none of that kind of stuff. My entire team's remote. It has been way before this whole thing. remote thing became trendy. I mean, you know, we're talking since 2008, I've been doing this. So when COVID came around, I'm like, oh, people were asking questions like, how has this affected your work? I'm like, no, not at all. I mean, you know, so it has, has made no difference to me or anybody on my team, I have to say. I imagine that it may have actually bolstered your business because more people were at home and had the time to take classes. So 2020, in that March, we had this, the biggest spike we've ever had, right? When everybody suddenly all the restrictions got put in place. The spike in the sense, so we had, if, you know, if you look at the hockey stick, we had like a little hockey stick moment. It's flattened out since then, but it hasn't gone back down again. You know, the world has come to the realization that these kind of things exist. You can learn things online and languages is one of them. So people are like, wait, why would I have to spend an hour in traffic to my local community college to pay, you know, $500 a month to be one person in a group of 12 when I can go online for half of that, have a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session from home in my pajamas with a professional tutor. Right. I mean, with a native speaker for a fraction of the cost. And now that people realize that, like, I'm not going back to that. I'm just going to do it here. I can do it whenever I want, whenever I want, even while I'm traveling. Right. I can continue taking my Spanish lessons. Are you attracting mostly Americans or? Depends on the language. Right. So for obviously for Americans, it's Spanish. That's the biggest one for English. Not so much Americans, even though amazingly, we have quite a few students in the United States who take English lessons with us, but they're generally immigrants who are trying to get their, their levels of English up around flexibility. And we're talking, again, we're not the cheapest. So if somebody's looking for like the cheapest English teachers, they don't come to us, they look for quality. So, you know, we've worked with like VPs of banks and presidents of banks who, you know, maybe went from Europe to the US and they're trying to keep it up and they, they take classes with us on their schedule, like in the middle of the workday. I have, I have an hour free on Wednesday, three o'clock. Can we have lessons? I'm like, sure. They schedule it right in our system and they're done. Um, we have a lot of people in Europe and a lot of people in Asia taking English. Then, you know, French is the next one. And French, yeah, US, Europe, we get a lot of those people over there. And then Portuguese, Italian, all the rest kind of go down from there um, as far as like Japanese. Even Mandarin, we don't have a huge demand for because as you say, there's a much higher demand for English in China than there is for Mandarin in the United States. And that that's an interesting point that I noticed because Americans want to do business with China and the Chinese want to do business with Americans. The cultural gap is far larger than the linguistic gap and you can teach language, but it's hard to teach cultural patience. 
I get I don't know how to say it, but like I can easily speak Chinese and understand why they're saying or doing or feeling what they are. But if you expect me to mirror that myself, it's hard as an American because even though I spent 10 years there, if I'm mad, I'm mad. And like, it's hard to control that once you feel that. And it's easy to get mad talking with Chinese people, in, especially in business, because they'll be pretty blatantly like trying to get you to show your emotions because for them, showing your emotions is something that like you're not supposed to do and if you show your emotions you basically lose the game and if you lose the game they don't really want to do business with you because they feel like they can't really trust you there, there's a lot of nuances to it so so you can teach an american how to be fluent in chinese but if you don't teach them how to also adopt the cultural aspect when you do it like it's basically useless to learn the language exactly and that's why you know i'm biased but we work with tutors who are native speakers in whatever language we're teaching right because these are people who have grown up in that culture exactly the culture you were talking about right they can explain those kinds of things it's not we would not hire for example an english tutor we got we always we get hundreds of applicants every month but an english tutor an example is we've had english tutors with phds from russia come and teach you know apply for jobs with us i'm like we can't hire you your english is i'm sure it's better than mine like if you ask me some grammatical rules in english i'm like i don't know but you would not necessarily understand the american culture even though you speak flawless English. If somebody asks you, like, why do people do this? What is this? I'll be honest, I didn't grow up in the United States, right? I sound American. Everybody who's listening to this podcast is like, wait, Ray's American. No, I am 42 years old and I've lived 27 years outside of the United States. I've lived way more time, in, you know, in Turkey and in Mexico than I have in the US. It gives me a weird culture shock because if somebody tells me about American football, I'm like, I vaguely know the rules, but I've never been to a game. And, you know, I think I the only thing I liked about the Super Bowl was the guacamole dip. I mean, you know, that's why I went to Super Bowl parties was to eat the food, right? Because I just did not grow up in that culture. I would not make a good English teacher as a result of that. Our Chinese teachers are from China. It's the same. Our Spanish teachers are from Latin America. We'll assign you a Spanish teacher from the country you want to go to, because even though they all speak Spanish, there are cultural differences, right? If you go to Mexico, if you go to Peru, if you go to Argentina, they have different accents, British, English, American, English, Australian, English, same thing. They'll all understand you, but you might say something that like, yeah, we don't say that here. But if you say, you know, coger un coche in Spain, it means to get a ride. If you say it in Mexico, it means you're probably trying to have kids with that car. So yeah, I mean, it, it's you know totally valid in some countries, not so valid in other countries. That's why you need a teacher from that country to teach you the culture as well, because otherwise you'll say some words that'll embarrass you a lot. I was an English teacher in China for the first five years I was there. And something that I noticed was even though there were other people who were native speakers teaching alongside me, almost every single one of them had never taught themselves a second language. And so I found that they didn't make good English teachers because they had no frame of reference for the student learning the language. And therefore it was necessary to explain this specific thing because you know, they're never going to get it if you don't. And the only way you know it is if you've been through the process yourself and having taught myself Spanish, German, and Mandarin, it was easy for me to relate to different students at different ages, different cultural things. So while it is important for that person to be a native speaker, there are things that they won't understand are even necessary without specific training. That's another requirement from our teachers, not only native speakers, they have to have college degrees. Most of our teachers have masters, but they also have had to have learned at least one other language. Now, in most cases with our teachers, it's English, right? Because most of their students are English. So I'm a native Spanish speaker, I speak English. I'm a native French speaker, I speak English. Um, but we do have some teachers who are polyglots. They speak five or six languages. And we find that generally those are the best teachers. Well, something else that was funny was when you're dealing with like high school and college age, even some middle school students if they start asking you things like, oh, is that an adjective or a noun? A lot of native speakers would be like, I have no adjective. No, I don't know. I, I put myself in that bucket because I'm like, I don't know. I have no clue. Why, why is an ED pronounced as a T sometimes and as an ED the other times? Right. So like sometimes they'd be like, uh, you should just ask the Chinese. like Because oh, you always have like a Chinese teacher with you who also speaks English. So they can help to like explain because they know the grammar, like they know the rules, they know all of that stuff. They're trained really hard in it. So like, especially in China, it wasn't like the foreign teacher was actually teaching you the language. It was trying to make the language learning process something you enjoy where the Chinese teacher actually teaches you the things you need to know and you practice it with the foreigner. And that's actually, you know, in a way, an ideal situation because we all, talk, we all know this, right? In high school, we took Spanish or French or whatever we had there. 
we were missing that second component. So we had somebody who knew the grammar, whoever it is, whether it was a native speaker or not that you took Spanish with in high school, you probably knew how to conjugate the main verbs and all the rest. If you went up high enough, you know, you, you might have even gotten to, uh, what do you call it, subjunctive or something like that, right? So you understood the general rule of it, but you had no, you never used it. You had no cultural context for it. So, if, you know, a few years after high school, other than buenos dias and como estas, you're, you're gone. I mean, most people don't know any of it. They're missing that commodity because they, you know, if they had had somebody from Spain or Mexico in the classroom, making the language come alive and talking to them about it, I bet you would have a much more successful language program in the United States and more Americans would be at least conversationally bilingual than they are right now. I think the bigger problem there is that America has no incentive to know other languages because to the north, they speak English. To the south, they speak Spanish, but like, ah, they're Mexicans. Yeah, and if, well, even if you go to the south, most of the places Americans go to in Mexico, the beach areas, all the Mexicans speak English. I mean, everybody there speaks English. So, you know, you'll get by in English and that doesn't only apply to Mexico probably applies to most of the world. I mean, you know, you and I are lucky that we speak like the language of the world. I've been to Thailand. My taxi driver, when I got off the plane, you know, in, in Bangkok and, you know, tried to take a taxi to Sukhumvit, they were like, yeah, I speak English. We spoke fluent English. He's like a taxi driver. I'm like, that's embarrassing. I, I learned how to say, you know, Kapun Ka, which is thank you in, in Thai. And that was pretty much the only thing I knew the whole month I was there. That was my last big trip before COVID, right? But you'll find people who speak English almost everywhere. We went to Japan. My wife and I spent about six weeks in Japan. and we went there with the idea that nobody, you know, there's this myth that nobody would speak any English while we were there. You better learn some Japanese, all the rest. So I learned some survival Japanese before we went. And then everybody spoke English. I think a part of it was because they were preparing for the Tokyo Olympics. And like, you know, we went to Tokyo, like all the trains had English signs and they were, you know, native English speakers saying, you're getting off at this stop next. You know, all the places that we went, which were more or less touristy, tons of people spoke English. Oddly enough, we met an old man who gave us a tour of a castle who spoke fluent Spanish. He was like 80. He's like, when I was in my 40s, I studied in Spain for five years. I haven't used it in 40 years. Can I practice with you and give you guys a free tour? So he gave us a tour of his castle in Spanish. So that was kind of cool as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that. I remember I was in Vietnam for the first time in 2011. And I did like a one month tour uh, starting in Saigon and going all the way up to Hanoi, actually to Sapa. Uh, I'm sure nobody knows what Sapa is. It's a very, very, very tiny little village at the top of a mountain in the middle of absolutely nowhere bordering on China. It's so high up that like the clouds go through the town. So often the town is completely covered in fog and you can barely see in front of you as you're walking. It's a, a starting off point for like a multi-day hike through the forests and the villages of, of the northern region of Vietnam. Probably to this day, the most amazing three days of my life. Just no, no telephones, no internet, barely any electricity at all. Yeah, staying with these families and they're, let's have pig tonight. You want pig? Yeah, okay. And they just kill the pig and then make it for you to eat. Yeah, we did the Inca Trail. It was a similar experience, like no cell phone, nothing on the entire day. We have a picture of us on the highest point of the Inca Trail. It was funny. It was like our group was about 10 people, but we're all like professionals, lawyers, entrepreneurs, business people. We, we took a photo of ourselves on the highest point with our cell phones trying to catch a signal just as, just as a joke because like we had all gone two days without checking our email, which like hadn't happened in years. So we're like, we're in withdrawal. We need to see if everything's okay. So yeah, I've been through that. It's amazing. I recommend it to everybody who's busy. Go on a hike where you have no internet for three or four days. You'll feel totally rejuvenated at the end of it. Well, so back then, smartphones just barely existed. I don't think I even had one. But I was in this random little village in the Mekong Delta. And it was on the way to the border with Cambodia. I just happened to like walk up to a little shop and there was this guy that walked out, a little old man, speaking in, in fluent English. He's like, yeah, I used to like work alongside the Americans during the war. And so like, yeah, I speak English. But then he, he heard me speak Chinese to my partner who was with me. And then he started speaking to me in Chinese. He's like, oh yeah, like, you know, communism, right? It's like, there's Chinese and we do business with them. It's like, I learned Chinese when I was younger. And it's like, yeah, we just get, it was just like really strange, this, you know, this, little guy in this little place where, like nobody ever visits and everybody in morocco speaks like 12 languages so generally my wife and i we speak a few languages so we always have like a secret language while you know while we're traveling yeah did not work in morocco like whatever languages we spoke everybody spoke i'm like come on i'm like you know what can we do I, actually a funny story not to go too far on that for us was we went to new york city 
a few years back. And my sister lived there at the time and she was, she's kind of a foodie. So she kind of gave us a little list of all these restaurants we had to try around the city. So we were there for about like a week. And I remember one night we went to a Jewish deli, right? So we go in there and they give us this menu. It was like six pages long. And I was like, she was like, I don't know what this is. She, but in Spanish, she was, the waiter was waiting for us. And she's like, I don't know what any of these things are in Spanish. She's like, you know, I answered in Spanish. I'm like, I don't really know. I've heard of matzo balls before, but otherwise I really don't know what any of these things are either. And we just kind of kept on talking for a minute. The waiter kind of sits there patiently and then kind of looks down at us and fluent Spanish. He's like, look, if you need any help to figure out what's on the menu, I can just tell you what this stuff is. <laughs> yeah, apparently he was like Jewish, but he was like from Puerto Rico or something like that. Fluent, absolutely fluent Spanish while we were there. We were like embarrassed. I'm like, yeah, Spanish is not a secret language in the United States because like too many people actually speak it. So yeah, that, that was our experience with trying to get away with that. I feel like if you tried to speak Mandarin in Morocco, you probably would have succeeded in having nobody understand you. You might be surprised. They are, yeah, I mean, well, we did the tour. We kind of came in from Tangiers and we had that, you know, we went into Chef Chawen, we went to the Sahara Desert Fez, kind of did all the thing and ended up, ended up in Marrakech. And yeah, like all the drivers of these cars, because the way that works there, you've been there, you've probably experienced the same. It's not like these big tour buses, you kind of rent like cars to take you around for like a week, right? Or an SUV and then you have like a private driver for the week. So that's what we did. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I speak like seven or eight languages. And we would like stop, you know, at these the more touristy places and these tourists would walk by speaking random languages and you just turn to them and speak to them in their language. I'm like, I don't even know what language you just spoke, right? I'm like, I do this for a living. I, you know, I give language lessons. I don't even know what you just spoke. So I was really impressed by Morocco and the way they learn languages. What I enjoyed about Morocco was that I was able to take a train from Madrid to Cadiz and I took a ferry across the Strait of Gibraltar, landed in Tangiers. Yeah, that's what we did. Then I, I took a taxi to the middle of town. I just started walking. I found a hotel for like $5 or whatever for the night. And then the next few days I just looked like researched Morocco. And then I was able to get on a train and I took a train overnight to wherever it was I went. I stayed with like this, this family. They had like a five story house that's like very narrow and you go up the winding stairs and there's a few other couples kind of staying there. I was by myself and I stayed there for a few days and then like I hired a van, but it wasn't just me. There was like a bunch of other people that I didn't know. And we drove into the desert and then we got off and we got on camels and we went to like a place to sleep for the night. And and then like from there, we got back into the van after, after breakfast, we got on the, we got on the camels again, went back to the town and and showered and all that and then went back in the van drove back towards like the western part out of the desert and all that so it's just like really cool because there's all these different modes of transportation and and all these different kinds of people and you you don't really experience that in a lot of other places and i think it's a north african kind of desert style life yeah it was the betterment lifestyle while you're there i mean we did we did exactly this probably most exactly the same thing you did right so we did that we went, got on a camel my camel's name was jimmy he almost he, almost, he tried to kill me um which is why i remember his name uh but yeah we did the same thing we camped out it was a little bit of glamping so our, our tents were actually had showers in them but like you know real western bathrooms and all the rest of it but we spent like two days out there out on the dunes um and then came back in went to a whole bunch of other sites and on our way to marrakesh um, but that was like, I think a whole week that we tried. So we didn't go all the way east that you did, but we went kind of south of Fizz and kind of went out from there. But definitely a trip worth doing. Well, I spent about three weeks in Morocco because whenever I travel, like I have no plans. I kind of just, I was in Barcelona uh, seeing my friends and I was like, okay, like, you know, I've been with you for a week. Let me just keep going. And then I took a train to Madrid and I was in Madrid for a week. And I was like, you know what? Forget Europe. Like I'm next to Africa. I've never been to Africa. Let's go to Africa. So I was like, all right, and book the next train down to Cadiz. Yeah, we started in Madrid. We went down to Granada. Then we went down to Cadiz. But we had to go somewhere else because there were too many, too much wind. So we went to a little town over, got another ferry over there. And yeah, that's how we ended up in Tangier. So for us, it was a little, little. we had to kind of stop in Gibraltar for a day because the wind was too high and we couldn't actually go across the street of Gibraltar for a day. But this is the fun of traveling if, for all the people who are listening. Be open to this kind of, you know, flexibility because stuff happens and just enjoy it. You know, we would never gone to the Rock of Gibraltar if we hadn't been stuck there for a day. With all due respect to the people in the United, K United Kingdom, the food is British and it was really, really bad. We tried to get a breakfast in Gibraltar and yeah, it was really, really bad. It's actually not a really pretty city. You know, you go there for the rock, but the city at the bottom is like a port town. So it's like all ports with like, you know, these big freight boxes and stuff like that. So it wasn't like that nice of a place, but you go and see the monkeys on the rock and, you know, it's kind of fun. 
So you had told me before that you went to Japan to learn uh, how to use a kendo. Talk about that a little bit. Kendo, for those of you who don't know, is Japanese fencing. If you don't kind of picture that in your head, imagine Star Wars and the Jedi fighting, because that's actually, um, Steven Spielberg apparently saw kendo in Japan, and that's what he based like the Jedi look off of. Um, so don't think European fencing. Uh, it's quite a bit more violent. We wear things that look like American football gear. Uh, and, you know, when you hit somebody over the head, it's with a bamboo stick. And that's the main target area is the head or the, the arms. And if you miss, because, you know, the arms, the target areas are protected. But if you miss, you're leaving a welt or a bruise on the person. So generally, beginners miss a lot more than advanced people. So I don't like going up against beginners because they're going to whack me at full strength on my arm coming home black and blue uh, later that day. So I've been practicing since my early 20s, and again, so I'm going on 42, so I've been practicing for on and off about 20 years, a little off for the Peace Corps, because there was no kendo in where I was doing, but I picked it up again afterwards, and I love it. So I started in the U.S., but, you know, I have a chance, I've had a chance to practice in Japan as well. My dream is to move there for a few years and practice in Japan with the native practitioners who start when they're like five, right? You know, I started when I was 20. Not that old by Western standards, but by the time I started, there were already people who, you know, who've been doing it for 15 years, which is the reason why Japan and Korea always win the world championships and like everybody else is just competing for the third spot like nobody else is even close to those top two spots because nobody else starts when they're five to practice that kind of thing but it's it's like a lot of the what you know the eastern martial arts it's got a lot of kind of a zen aspect to it we meditate at the beginning of each class we meditate at the end of each class to kind of come in and out of it there's a lot of philosophy into it where in kendo there are no blocks they're only attacks they're only four attacks technically speaking they're like techniques you can do but you know the four target areas and there are four attacks. And you practice for 50 years to perfect these four attacks. That's all there is to it. I could teach you the four attacks in Kendo in five minutes. And there are people who've been practicing it for 70 years. And that's all there, you know, because there's the philosophy, your mind and body, you know, there's actually Kiken Taiichi, which means mind, body, and spirit are one. And that's a lot of what's Kendo. It's when you hit somebody on a target, you actually have to yell what the target you're aiming for is. So you don't accidentally hit a target. You know, if you hit your arm and you yelled out the wrong target, you would not actually, you know, you wouldn't get the point because they're judges there that would give you the point. It's like the final ball in billiards. Exactly, exactly. You have to call it, right? If your foot doesn't hit the ground at the same time you hit the target, you don't do it because your body wasn't one with your sword. So all of those things have to happen at exactly the same time. Otherwise, you don't get the point. You know, I could hit your target and it's like, oops, it was an accident because I didn't yell it. My foot didn't hit there. My body was misaligned. So there's a lot of that. That's what you spend all the time doing in Kendo. And I find that applies to entrepreneurship as well. I was just going to say that if you say you're going to do something, but then it doesn't connect, then like you've just missed the point. That's exact. And it's not just about connecting at one level in business, right? Which is like, let's say I got the Facebook ads to work, but then I don't deliver the product at the end of it. I got somebody to buy, but then my delivery was awful. Or I got somebody to sign up for my lead magnet, but then I had my email sequence afterwards to get them to buy the product was awful. So if you look at it from like a sales funnel point of view, generally speaking, you know, you can complicate things a lot. But, you know, you want to get people in the top of the funnel, move them to the middle of the funnel, move them to the end of the funnel, make the sale. Four steps. That's all there is to it. And if any one of those steps is off, your funnel is not going to be profitable. That's what Kendo is as well. If any one of those steps is off, you're not getting the point. And that's why I love the philosophy. I mean, I, you know, I use it in my entrepreneurship. I actually have point paintings and quote, quotes of Kendo around my office that, uh, that kind of inspire me every day. I feel like I should give all of my executives free Kendo training. In addition to that, one of the things I jokingly say, so Kendo essentially you yell, Kiai, and you hit somebody on the head with a stick. And I always joke that I'm like, look, you can go to a shrink and pay $150 an hour to get a little styrofoam thing where you hit everybody and you yell and you get stress out. Or you can go to Kendo and do that for free. The difference of Kendo and a lot of other martial arts that's been commercialized in the US and around the world, nobody makes money off of Kendo. There is no like professional Kendo teacher in the United States who doesn't have a day job. Kendo is a passion. We all do it. If there is a charge for your local Kendo dojo, it's usually to pay the rent. You know, karate teachers, they have a karate school. That's it. That's what they make a living off of. Almost everybody practices Kendo. And I think it's because the, the gear is very expensive. Like an entry level gear for Kendo is about $500 to $1,000. So I think that pushes a lot of people out of it. Like almost all of my senseis have always been doctors, entrepreneurs, CEOs of companies, because it kind of attracts a certain kind of mindset and certain kind of people. Because not everybody wants to do the same, same thing day in and day out for 40 years. But if you want to be really good at your business, you know, at business, that's what you have to do. I have 15 years of providing language lessons to people to get to the level I'm at. You, there's no shortcut to this, right? There's no like, you know, you can't build up the experience necessary to get to a high level of business without really putting in the reps, you know, without actually doing the work, without building the experience, without failing a few times. You hear about the people that they put on Forbes, 30 days and you've got a business and you exited $40 million, the unicorns. 
And we think that's the norm. I guarantee you, you go out and interview a hundred, seven, eight, nine figure entrepreneurs, and that's not their story. They probably woke up every day, worked their butt off, doing pretty much the same thing and executing well every single day. And that's how they reach their success. Why don't they write a book about it? Because nobody wants to hear that, right? Nobody wants to hear, how do you get successful? Well, you kind of have to work at it. You know, I'm sure in Chinese philosophy, there's that, you know, there's no, there's no shortcut to the top of the mountain. You take one step every day and you climb the mountain. And entrepreneurship is exactly the same thing. So that's my, my behind, you know, back of the napkin philosophy or theory as to why people who are high level of kendo tend to be, tend to be very successful professionals or entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. So the Chinese uh, phrase you're thinking of is uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You don't jump a thousand miles, right? You just got to keep on taking steps till you get there. You were talking about interviewing a bunch of people and, and seeing how they did it. I've had conversations with over 200 company owners of which just under half I've actually published the recordings. I would say a few percent of them have raised money from investors. That's the non-sexy story about startups that most people don't want to hear, right? Because the, you know, I raised $500 million in capital. That makes the news. I worked for 20 years to, to bootstrap my business from, you know, with $5,000 in the bank, it was not an overnight success. I wasn't driving a Rolls Royce six, 90 days after I launched. I just worked every single day. One of the books, one of my favorite books, and I'll recommend it to everybody who's listening is called the millionaire next door. Now it's the numbers in there are a little bit dated right now. because it's about 20 years old. So it talks about millionaires, but inflation, just multiply everything by two or even three to get it there. But they actually examined in that book, like, you know, who the real millionaires specifically in the United States were. The first story is the one I remember the most from the book where they were apparently working at some kind of financial organization, you know, like say Fidelity or something like that. And they were, they wanted to invite a hundred richest people in their portfolio to find out a little bit more about them so they could get more people like them to join. So they invited them all to this fancy restaurant in New York city. They flew them all out, all that kind of stuff. So they're waiting there the first night for the people to arrive. So they put out like caviar, they have a Michelin star chef, high end champagne. And this guy walks in, he's got like a t shirt, a cowboy hat, you know, a white t shirt, a cowboy hat, and jeans on. And they're like, somebody got lost, you know, he's in the wrong place. And so he kind of walks up and they look at they look at their list and they're like, he's he's like, What's your name? He's they see his name's like the third richest person on their list. They're like, holy crap. Oh, that must be a coincidence, right? So he sits down, they ask him what he wants, he's like, give me a Bud Light. You know, he doesn't want the champagne, he doesn't want the caviar, he doesn't want anything. He's like, just give me a Bud Light. And then the second guy walks in. And it's like the same thing. Then the third guy, then the fourth guy. And by the end of the night, they're like, okay, the people who look rich, the ones who had the Rolex watches and the suits and all the rest of it, they weren't actually the wealthiest people in their portfolio, right? It was these millionaires next door. Then they wrote a whole book about what really makes a millionaire in the United States. Um, You know, how do they live? Do they live in these fancy lifestyles that we see on the rich and famous? Did they become overnight successes? Absolutely not. Do they live badly? Don't get me wrong, they do. You know, average millionaire, according to their study, drives a luxury car. It's usually a used luxury car because, you know, we're cheap. We don't want to pay full price. I want to pay 40% less uh, two years later. So like, you know, buy a BMW, buy a Cadillac, just buy a two-year-old Cadillac. So somebody else paid that, you know, ridiculous sticker price. And you're still getting a car that looks like fancy and you can drive it for the next five years. And then you sell it for probably almost the same price you paid for it because luxury cars retain their value more. Do they live in like mansions? No, they live in nice neighborhoods, but they live in the same house for like 30 or 40 years, right? So their house is like totally paid off. They have no mortgage. I mean, we're, my wife and I are lucky. We have no mortgage. We have no rent. We have not had mortgage or rent for almost 10 years now. Those are the little kind of things that real millionaires do. Also, don't buy your kids a car or a house, but I'll let you read the book about that <laughs> and find the studies behind that. But yeah, highly recommend the book. In Asia, you can see that in play. There's a lot of people that were extremely flashy. It's not like America where I can't just go, hey man, how much money do you have? And you'll be like, well, I've got about $15 million. You're not going to tell me, I'm not going to ask. But in Asia, like you know these things, people will talk about them quite easily. And it's obvious, even though they're being honest, The ones who have less money are trying to pretend as if they have more. And so they'll be more flashy and they'll have like a hundred thousand dollar watch. And you're like, but why, man? My Fitbit will tell exactly the same time that your hundred thousand dollar watch does. And it counts my steps. Does your hundred thousand dollar watch do that? Probably not. I learned that the best way to enjoy your wealth is to make it so that nobody knows you have it. Because if people know you have it, then you can't trust that they like you for who you are. I drive a Mazda. My wife has a Hyundai. I don't have a car. The story here is interesting. The first car we bought in 10 years was a 14 year old Nissan Rogue that we bought because our friend, she was getting divorced and needed the money. All she got in the divorce was the car and she needed the money. So, and it was like $3,000. I mean, it was like, you know, it was a junk. It had like a 
120,000 miles on it. We bought that like three years ago now. And then since my wife got pregnant and we're like, okay, we need a car that, that won't break down on the way to the hospital. So let's buy something. So we bought a Hyundai. Then our red, unfortunately, our Nissan Rogue broke down. I'm like, we actually need two cars now because we have to go around. So I bought a Mazda. But I mean, those are the only reason. If we didn't have a child, we would not have a car right now because an Uber in Mexico is like three bucks to get across town. It's like having my own private driver. I don't have to worry about traffic or anything. I can listen to something. I can get some work done. I don't have to do any of the driving. We just did have when he had kids, and you know, once he gets older, I think by the time he's five, I, I'll put him. I'll put him to work in the office, and hopefully, he'll can you know he can. He can drive himself to school after that when he's five years old. So uh, that, that's my plan, at least. I don't think my wife will, will approve. When I was living in Vietnam, we would use uh, not Uber, but Grab. Mm-hmm. That's Southeast Asia, right? That's the big one. Yeah. Right. And I could pay a dollar to $2 for a motorbike to pick me up. And if I wanted to splurge for a car, it would add an extra dollar or two to the ride. I would splurge for a car in Thailand, right? It's not like it's raining here. I'm like, I don't want to, but it's like three or four bucks. I'm like, look, yeah, owning a car plus insurance plus gas. Even if I took one every day, let's just say I worked in Vietnam or Thailand, right? We took one to work and back every single day. You do the math and you're like, yeah, that's like 500 bucks a month. But what's your car payment, insurance and gas in the United States for a car? Way, probably way more than that. Let's just say you have two cars. Talking twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I'm like it's crazy when I hear some of my buddies in the U.S. and how much they're paying for cars. And we're not talking luxury, right? If you're trying to buy your a Tesla, you're paying way more than that for your car as well. And this is money you throw down the drain generally, right? Because cars are not appreciating assets. I've started, you know, my chocolate factory. I started for twenty thousand dollars. That's a car. I started a friggin' chocolate factory that made me that money back multiple times over for less than you know most people spend on the car. I'd much rather spend it on something that's going to earn me money than something that you know wasted on something that's just going to get me to the grocery store once a week. Did you make a car out of chocolate? No, unfortunately we did not. Even though now I might have to go and buy. So I sold my shares to my partner, so I'm still good friends. But I mean, it was a totally amicable sale. I'm going to have to contact her after this podcast and see, uh, see if we can get on that for the next time I visit the Philippines. Yeah, just be like, hey, just make a car that's made out, like you could eat. Like, That's who doesn't it. want a car you can eat? Marketing, <laughs> pure marketing, right? People would visit us to see that. Especially if you have nanotechnology injected into it so that as you eat it, it repairs itself. So you could keep eating it over and over again. So it's like a perpetual, not, not a perpetual motion machine, but like a... Perpetual chocolate machine or something like that. Right? I'm going to call Elon, see if he can get on that. I think this is almost as high priority as colonizing Mars for him. So I, I think I can get that work out. If you could keep the people on Mars supplied with, you know, chocolate for their entire life, I think it's a good deal. Maybe he would be willing to buy it, buy into the factory. I might be able to get an intro. I actually, I was lucky about eight weeks ago, or I guess nine weeks ago, I was on Richard Branson Island. I was actually hanging out with him. So apparently he, he knows Elon pretty well. So we'll, I, I might try to ask, I'm like, hey, Richard, give me an intro to Elon. See, see if we can get this whole nano chocolate thing that Sean mentioned going. So I'll, I'll send an email after this, see if, see if we can get that ball rolling. Just don't forget to to cut me in. Yeah, well, I'll give you some free. I'll give you the wheel, so you can pretty much just like eat as much chocolate as you want, and just kind of comes back, right? I'll make sure your factory in China is up to snuff. That well, yes, I said if I owned it, I might be talking to you because getting those boxes for our packaging from China from Shenzhen was a whole other story. That's where I lived. Uh huh. I know Shenzhen blindfolded. I know, and that's I mean, trust me, that's my experience. With, that's why I know when Alibaba's bad translation because. I have had to deal with that myself when I was trying to first get, I didn't even know what MOQ meant when I first, you know, when I started my job. In fact, I'm like, MOQ, what the heck? I, I'm like Googling, what is MOQ? Oh, minimum order quantity. That makes sense. Yeah, we were trying to get somebody to send us like 100 boxes because we were just starting off. Nobody bakes 100 boxes in China. Like, like nobody would even dare talk to us, right? It was like 5,000. We were lucky to find 5,000. Yeah, I was going to say probably like 100,000. Tenth, a lot of people were willing to do 10,000, but we found one that was willing to do 5,000. Obviously, the per unit price was a little higher, but I'm like, just give us those. And they ended up being the people we worked with in the long term. So it paid off for them to kind of make that lower, lower deal for us. But yeah, I mean, I, it was a total education for me. I had no idea how any of that stuff worked. I'm in a group of entrepreneurs that are six plus figure and a lot of them do like drop shipping or they've got their own e-commerce uh, white label that they do on Amazon. And right now they're talking about how like China is screwing them for shipping the products on time. And I was like, guys, look, it's New Year's time for them. They're off for the next five, six weeks. You're screwed. Like nothing's happening until February. Just get over it. 
And if you're a drop shipper that doesn't have high volume, you really have very little sway. I mean, if you're if you're moving like thousands of units a month, you can probably call the factory and they might do something for you. But if you're selling like 100 units a month, most of these factories over there are beasts. They're producing millions of units a month. They don't care about you who have 100 units. They're not going to reopen a production line just because this one guy in the United States who sells 100, I don't know, widgets on his website is complaining about it. It's just not high enough priority for them. If, you know, Microsoft calls them up or, I mean, you know, if Apple calls them up and says, we need more of these, yeah, they'll open the factory and they'll make that happen because that's millions and millions of units. I've seen some of the screenshots of these guys, like some of them are, are doing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a month, but they don't know Chinese. So it doesn't matter. The factory doesn't care. They won't do anything for them. If they were thinking bigger, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't be doing drop shipping. They'd be building their own sustainable brands. So I own a website called howmuchtoiletpaper.com. I tried drop shipping with that purchased it two years ago because it went viral during COVID. For those of you who know SEO, it had it like it got like 5,000 backlinks. We're talking, it was featured on the BBC because there were millions of visits a day for a period of about 30 to 40 days. I purchased it from the kid who made it. I did not make it. And I tried putting up a drop shipping site on there when I was, I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm like, hey, let's throw up a drop shipping site. Yeah, I experienced everything that you're talking about. You know, we had good enough SEO that we ranked and we started selling stuff right, pretty, pretty right away. But I didn't know what I was doing. And I drop shipping and I got complaints for like 120 day shipping times and all, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, I have other businesses I'm running right now. I don't have time to run this and build this business out by myself. And it's not my area of expertise. It would take me years to gain what you, Sean, have. And I just did not have the time to learn that stuff, right? So yeah, if you're going to drop shipping, don't believe the courses you buy on Udemy, which say you're going to be selling a million pro million dollars in products in 30 days. It, there's a lot more to it than that. Overall, what advice do you have for people that you've learned from all of your entrepreneurial experiences? Yeah, so I think the biggest lesson I've learned, and this is actually relatively recent, so I'm going to share with the audience. I've done you know about 200 podcasts, but you're one of the first ones I'm sharing this bit of advice on because it came to me in the last few weeks. Be more intentional about what you're doing, right? Intentional does not mean I'm building this business just because I want to make a lot of money, which honestly, that's how I started as well. But on that recent recent trip I had to Necker Island, where I had the opportunity to be sitting down with, you know, one of the richest men in the world. I was next to a Nobel laureate. I was next to some, like somebody who ran Google X, um, Dr. Teller, who was like the smartest guy in Google. And you start seeing things that the way that they look at the world is very different from us. We do things when we need to but we don't necessarily do them with intention, right? I mean, you know, I, I ate that because I was hungry, right? Instead of eating something healthy because it's going to make me feel better in a week. And the same thing in business. We sometimes spend all day putting out fires instead of working on what's going to grow the business. And the final thing is we don't think about why we want the business in the first place, right? What's the fulfillment we're looking for? I built businesses that have made me, that were successful and that have made me miserable. And I just didn't know any better when I was doing it. So be intentional about everything you're doing and you'll live a happier life for it. And you might not have a business quite as big as you wanted, but you'll be really happy. Most of us, I think, would be perfectly happy with a business that made, you know, $500,000 profit a year, right? You're digging on 500000 but you could spend all your time with your friends and your family and your kids. We'll be fine. A million wouldn't make you that much happier. There was actually a study that was done which said once you make more than 70,000, you really don't see much more happiness. That's it. It's kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Once your food, your housing, and your health, once those three things are kind of taken care of, everything else, you know, Ferrari doesn't make you any happier. Actually, my mindset coach gave me one quote there that was kind of interesting saying that, you know, money just makes us more of who we are. Instead, So, you know, if you're miserable and you make a lot of money, you're just going to be more miserable. If you're already happy without making a lot of money, you might be a little bit happier, but it's not changing everything, right? It's it's who you are just amplified. So don't look at money to solve all your problems. It's good advice. So how can people follow up with you? Yeah, so I'm not that famous uh, in the sense that, you know, I don't build brands around myself. So it's not like, you know, I'm not going to say follow me on Instagram. I, I always take the joke. I'm like, I'm not on Instagram because I don't look very good in bikinis, which I'm assuming that's how most of the famous people on Instagram are. You can f find me on Facebook, Ray Blakeney. You can just add me there. You look for somebody who's doing Kendall. That's kind of my photo. It's more my personal page. I do have a website called rayblakeney.com. If somebody insisted, I put it up. So you can contact me there. This contact form comes directly to me. Or you can go to my businesses, livelingua.com, L-I-V-E-L-I-N-G-U-A.com. Or my newest business, podcasthawk.com, which is a SaaS product that helps you get booked on podcasts on autopilot. You can also contact me through that as well. So in both cases, go to the contact form. It'll go to support, but they will pass it on to me. I'm not that hard to get in touch with if you're interested. Thank you very much for your time and your energy, Ray. I really appreciate it. If you like this episode, it's probably because this is very different than the normal episodes that I do. <laughs> uh, so 
definitely let other people know about it if you think they would find value in this, especially I think the kendo allegory. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And don't forget that it's okay to run your business without raising funds from other people to do it.